art science uh, in managing uh, respiratory problems and hemodynamic problems in neonate. Uh, just uh, uh, few minutes ago, we were, uh, I was talking with Dr. Iman Iskandar and Dr. Mu'tazza, and we were saying that uh, being a neonatology is a commitment, and it is a link. We neonatologists who are much linked to each other rather than linked to our university or our faculty. It's sort of commitment and sort of uh, uh, tight link between us. We hope that this link between different universities, between different countries, between Tur Mohagra, Lina, Egyptian abroad, uh, coming to help us and to raise the standard of neonatal help. We hope that this will bring uh, much help to the uh, Egyptian uh, neonatal uh, com committee uh, children and those working with these children for the sake of all children in the world. Neonatology is the promise, it is the future of the country, it is the future of the world and uh, we are thankful for those who came here to help us to improve such future. Shukran liku jamihan wa ahlan biku ونتمنى انه يبقى هذا الاجتماع العلمي فيه فايده لينا جميعا. نبتدي باذن الله الجلسه الاولى وندعو الشير بيرسونز للتفضل لل Sabah uh, al-Khir. It's really a pleasure and honor to participate in such highly scientific meeting. And I'm saida gidan tabhan to be among my friends and colleagues. Uh, I must be thankful to the Dr. Safa Shafi and the Dr. Taban Hisham Awad as Zamil Al Aziz. Um, I have the honor to introduce Professor Robin Alvero. Associate Professor and Medical Director, Neonatology and Pediatrics in University of uh, Manitopia, Canada, uh, giving us a uh, talk about case-based uh, scenarios on the mechanical, mechanical ventilation in preterm and term infants. Please, thank you. المؤتمر كله أو الكونفرنس كله عبارة عن questions and answers يعني البروفيسورز هيقولوا محاضرات وإحنا هنجهز لو سمحتوا بعد إذنكم أسئلة في ورقة والمودريتو الدكتورة سوندوس هتمر تاخد الورق بعد السيشنز الأولانية في نهايتها في عندنا نص ساعة panel discussions وهنبقى نفتح الأسئلة بتاعتكم بإذن الله تعالى هناخدها نتكلمها Oh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this conference for allowing me to uh, be here today and uh, make these presentations and a chance for me to uh, get to know your country. Uh, I've never been here before. This is the first time in Egypt. Uh, so far, it's been great. Uh, I have a few more days left uh, in your beautiful country, so I'm, I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to uh, see more of it. So the first um, presentation today 
Um, we're going to talk about the challenges of mechanical ventilation uh, in preterm and term infants. Um, I have no conflict of interest to declare. And the objective for today's presentation will be uh, first to identify basic principles of how to ventilate newborn infants. Second, to describe the challenges of invasive ventilation in preterm and term infants. Third, to enumerate the measurements to be taken to prevent lung injury. And finally, to discuss uh, case-based scenarios where we can discuss um, uh, how, what to do uh, in, th in those cases. So, uh, as you know, mechanical ventilation is, is life-saving for many of our babies, but we know that mechanical ventilation has been associated with uh, acute lung injury, it's been associated with uh, 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 infections, uh, ventilated acquired pneumonias, and especially in preterm infants, is associated with chronic lung disease and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So for us, neonatologists, to know how to ventilate uh, or how to use this machine efficiently and safely is very, very crucial for all of us. Okay? So there are some basic principles of uh, ventilatory efficiency that we need to be aware of. First of all, we need to understand that we need to develop a specific strategy for a specific pathophysiology. Not all the lung conditions, not all the pathophysiologies are the same, and not all the pathophysiologies can be treated equally. So we need to adjust our treatment according to the type of lung disease that we're dealing with. Second, we need to be able to pick the ventilator that can deliver the specific strategy for that pathophysiology. So not all the ventilators can be used for all the pathophysiologies, okay? We need to pick the ventilator that specifically will work best for that type of lung disease that we are dealing with, okay? Third, uh, lung conditions are not statics. Lung conditions change a lot, and sometimes they change quite quickly, okay? Especially when we give surfactant to a preterm infant, the lung can change significantly within minutes or hours. So we need to be able to adjust our ventilatory strategy according to those changes that we are seeing uh, in, in the lung that uh, we are treating. And finally, intubation is not the default. The, the default should be extubation. So as soon as you intubate, always, always work towards trying to see when will be the best time to take the tube out. Okay? Never leave the baby intubated just because it's more comfortable for the baby or for the nurses or for the person on call. If the baby is ready to be extubated, extubate as soon as, is, uh, is, as soon as possible, okay? And always your goal should be to extubate, okay? Not to have normal blood gases, not to have, uh, it's always a goal to extubate. Now, having said all this, there are some general principles uh, of assisted ventilation that will be applied to almost every single lung condition and every single uh, ventilator, okay? And those are our four uh, goals. First, always try to achieve uniform lung inflation. So regardless of the condition you're dealing with, regardless of the ventilator you're using, always try to achieve uniform lung inflation, both lungs top to bottom. Second, always try to minimize overinflation and underinflation. Okay? Overinflation will lead you to volume trauma, and underinflation will lead you to atelectal trauma. So always, regardless of the lung condition you're dealing with, regardless of the ventilator you're using, always try to avoid those two problems. Third, oxygen is toxic, especially in preterm infant. So always try to minimize the amount of oxygen you give. Okay? Always use the right oxygen saturation uh, target, now we have the NIRS that Dr. Yas is going to talk, I'm sure, um, in one of the, his sessions. Uh, if you have that ability, always use the NIRS also to see if you can minimize the amount of oxygen they're exposing the babies to. And as I said before, always, always early appropriate extubation. Okay? Those, these four goals are going to be applied to every single condition and every ventilator you're using. Okay? 
Good. So, uh, when I said try to keep the lungs open, um, why do we need to keep the lungs open? That we know there are benefits for keeping the lungs open. First, because you have more homogeneous distribution of, of gas. Second, because you have a decreased regional atelectasis. Uh, you usually maximize the ventilation uh, perfusion uh, ratio. Uh, you, if you have the lungs open, you also reduce the amount of intrapulmonary shunt, right to left. And uh, if, you, if your lungs are open, your pulmonary vascular resistance will also be down, so your pulmonary blood flow will improve. And if your lungs are open, you're also going to be able to use less oxygen that we know is, is toxic. So uh, these are all benefits of trying to keep the lungs open when you, uh, when you ventilate a baby. Now, here is a diagram that will show you the type of uh, a trauma that you can get when we use a ventilator. So the red zones are the bad zones. So the top one is the volume trauma zone, and the bottom red zone is the telectrotrauma zone. So we try to see if we can maintain uh, the lungs in that safe window between those two uh, red uh, areas. So you can damage the lungs by using very high volumes and very low peeps. And this is the worst case because you are causing volume trauma and atelectotrauma. Now you can also cause damage by using the right amount of volume if your peep is too high. So if you start too high with your peep, even if you use physiologic volumes, you can also cause volume trauma, okay? So both has to be adequate. Third, you can also cause atelectotrauma if you're using physiologic volume if your PEEP is too low, okay? So if your PEEP is too low, you're gonna cause atelectotrauma even when you use uh, normal physiologic volume. So ideally, you wanna use the right amount of PEEP and the right amount of volume to stay in that safe window. Now, you're gonna tell me, well, that's easy. Yeah, so we'll do that and we'll prevent a lung injury in every single baby. Now, the problem with that is, okay, and then now, so uh, use adequate PEEP to maintain FRC and avoid trauma, and use adequate volume to avoid volume, volume trauma. Why is it difficult to achieve these two goals? I'm gonna show you a, a study that was done uh, many years ago that shows uh, the lung volume uh, comparison between adults, newborns, terms, and newborn preterms. So here we have everything above those arrows are uh, excess uh, uh, volume, and anything below that bottom arrow in red means uh, decreased volume. So ideally you want to maintain, you want to ventilate uh, those lungs between the, the two arrows. And as you can see in adults, you have a lot of space. You have about 80 uh, minus 20, so 60 ml per kilo of volume that you can use to ventilate those lungs. So you have a lot of room to move. Now when you compare this graph with what we see in term infants, now we are talking about only 15 to 20 ml per kilo. So it's going to be much, much tougher, much more difficult to maintain your ventilation in that safe window between the two arrows. And if now you're comparing with preterm, look at what happened with preterm. The preterm has very minimal safe zone. It's only five to 10 per kilo. So it's almost impossible, even if we try to do our best, to always maintain the lung volume of preterm infant in a safe window, okay? That's why we have to be extremely, extremely careful when we ventilate the, these preterm infants. So um, I'm gonna give you two or three uh, things that will help us to avoid lung injury, uh, or try to minimize uh, lung injury. So first of all is uh, how we need to reduce over distension using uh, too much volume, okay? We know that over distension is more important than too much pressure, okay? So it's not so much the pressure you're using, it's how much volume you're using. Most of the damage is done by excess volume, not excess pressure. So don't pay too much attention to that pressure number, okay? Second, we know that very high pressures have little adverse effect if over distension is prevented. So if you are not causing over distension, uh, the number you are getting on the pressure is not as important. It is important, but not as important as when we have over distension. Now, 
the question is how we determine over this tension. How do we know that we're causing over this tension? And we're gonna go through that too, okay? So first, you can use a chest X-ray. The chest X-ray will help you to know how well the, the lungs are expanded. Uh, you look at the number of ribs that you have um, that are open. You look at the shape of the diaphragms to see if the diaphragms are very flat or not. And you also look, also look at the size of the heart. It will tell you if you get hyperinflation if the heart is too small. You can also look at the blood gases to know if you have problems mostly with retention of CO2 with little changes in oxygenation. That tells you that you're dealing with air trapping and over distension, okay? And third, you look at pulmonary graphics, okay? We have this beautiful pulmonary graphic that most new ventilators will um, allow us to know if you're actually having problem with over distension or not, and we're gonna go through that. Okay, so how we reduce, how do we reduce over distension? So first of all, we need to try to use volumes that are not too high, okay? Uh, Ideally, you want to use a ventilator that will allow you to use a volume guarantee on volume target ventilation, in which you can actually control the amount of volume that you give with each breath, okay? So most of the new machines will allow you to do that, okay? And the pressure will vary, but the volume will always be around that your target volume that you set. How do you also prevent over distension? Is by uh, preventing any expiratory lung volume from being too high using the right peep. Third, preventing air trapping. Okay, so sometimes, as you said before, we can use the, light, the right volume, but if your peep is too high or you start with a higher baseline, you could cause over distension by using too much peep. And that high peep could be set wrong by you using too much peep, or it could be uh, secondary to air trapping causing uh, uh, inadverted peep. And also you can cause or prevent over distension by uh, preventing the inspiratory times to be too long, okay? So we're gonna go through these uh, cases. So when you look at uh, the volume that you need to use and how do we know that the volume they're using is too high and is causing over distension, when well, you look at the pulmonary graphics that relate volume with pressure, okay? So this is a volume pressure loop. Uh, pressure is on the bottom, the horizontal axis, and uh, volume is on the vertical axis. So what we do is we look at the relationship between the C20 over the total compliance of those lungs. And you divide the two. So the total compliance, it's going from the bottom to the top. And the C20 is the last 20% uh, number from that curve. So you divide the 20% of the top, and you divide that between the total compliance. Ideally, if you don't have over distension, those two lines should be exactly the same. However, when your top 20% is significantly lower than the total compliance, that means that you're getting over distension, meaning that you are causing a, a, a beak on that uh, volume pressure curve. You're using too much volume, and at the top part of the curve is too flat, meaning that you are all, only what you're doing is only increasing your pressure without getting extra volume. So if you divide C20 over uh, com total compliance, and your number is less than 0.8, you most likely are dealing with over distension, and you need to do something about it. As I said before, always try to use physiologic tidal volumes when you ventilate. Now, in general, we use uh, expiratory tidal volumes target around four to five per kilo. Now, th this is such a number, and also will depend on the type of pathophysiology you're dealing with. For uh, new lungs, small babies, term infant, most babies will be able to ventilate properly with four to five per kilo. If you're dealing with an extremely low preterm infant, in which you have a lot of dead space in your flow transducer, you may need to use higher volume than that. If you're dealing with a chronic condition uh, like BPD, in which your um, airway compliance is very high and your dead space is very high, you may use, need to use higher volumes, okay? So this is just a, a, a number that we use when we treat acute lung disease in most uh, term infants, okay? 
And we know that uh, there have been studies showing that uh, when you use target volume ventilation, you actually decrease the risk of uh, chronic gland disease, uh, decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation, uh, the incidence of pneumothoraces, uh, the degree of hypocarbia, and also brain injury when you maintain the CO2 in normal range. Okay? Um, so always try to use a volume guarantee. Now, uh, how do we use, uh, how do we reduce over distension uh, by uh, not using PEEP that is too high? Always, always, uh, when the FiO2 start falling and you're requiring less and less oxygen, most of the time you need to decrease the PEEP, okay? And if you did the right move, you will see that if you decrease your PEEP and your PIP, your peak inspiratory uh, pressure uh, falls, goes down. Uh, if you're on volume ventilation, you did the right move, okay? However, if you decrease your PEEP and your PIP now is going up, then you are losing compliance. You are losing volume in your lungs. So you always, always have to look at the results of your changes. So when you decrease the PEEP, if you did the right move and the compliance curve is better or the same, your PIP should start going down if you're using volume ventilation. If you are not using volume ventilation, you can look at actually the volume that you're achieving when you decrease your PEEP. So if you decrease your PEEP and you're using uh, pressure ventilation, your volume should actually increase, okay? Because your compliance is better or the same, okay? So here now is an example of how to detect air trapping, okay? When your PEEP is too high. Now, the, again, your PEEP could be too high because you're using the wrong number, you're using too much PEEP, or because you have inadverted PEEP, okay? And inadverted PEEP can happen because your expiratory time is too short, okay? For the, lung of, for the type of pathophysiology you're dealing with. So, and the, this could be used because you're ventilating the baby too fast, that rate is too, too high, or because your airway resistance is too uh, high and then you need a longer expiratory time to be able to empty the lungs properly, okay? And the way you know is by looking at the flow waveform on the pulmonary graphics, okay? As you can see, the blue is the inspiratory flow. The yellow is the expiratory uh, flow. The dotted line is what should be the normal flow, expiratory flow. It always should go back to baseline before the next breath starts. When your yellow line, your expiratory flow, does not reach baseline before the next breath starts, then you are dealing with inadvertent PEEP. So you're starting already with a much higher PEEP than you think you are. You think you're using a PEEP of 6, 7, but you're actually using a PEEP of 9 or 10 because you're not allowing the lungs to completely be empty before the next breath, okay? So in this case, you need to uh, allow more time for expiration to allow that expiratory flow to reach uh, baseline. Now, uh, the other thing that I said is that we need to be, be able to use the right inspiratory time. If your inspiratory time is too short, too long, you could cause problem. So here is an example on the left in which your inspiratory time is too short. Now, for that, we look at the flow waveform on the top and the pressure waveform on the bottom. As you can see here, your expiration starts before the inspiratory flow reaches baseline, okay? So your inspiratory time is too short. What happened is that, as you can see on the bottom, your pressure does not reach. So you are unable to really expand the alveoli because your inspiratory time is too short. Then you are not achieving that peak inspiratory pressure that you think you should be achieving. Okay, so always look at the flow and the pressure. Here's an example of what you should be seeing. This is ideal. Here we have a normal inspiratory time and a normal expiratory time. As you can see, the inspiratory flow reaches baseline. You have a small brief pause before expiration starts. Okay, and when expiration finish, it goes back to baseline. As you can see now, you have achieved the PIP that you, you think you should be achieving, 
with a very, very small or no plateau at all. Okay? So this is the ideal waveform that you should be looking at. Now, now I'm going to give you on the right an example of when your inspiratory time is uh, too long. If you're taking too much time for your inspiration, then you're going to take time away from your expiration. So here you can see that inspiration reaches baseline, but it takes a long time for that expiration to start. So your inspiratory time is too long. So what happened with that is, first of all, your PIP plateau is too long. You're keeping the pressure inside the alveolar for too long because you are not ending inspiratory time soon enough. Okay? So your peak inspiratory pressure is too high. And then now, because your expiratory time is too short, you're going to end up with air trapping or auto peep, in which the ins next inspiration starts before the expiratory flow reaches uh, baseline. Oh, right. There you are. There you are. OK. So this is your excess inspiratory time. This is your plateau in here. It's too long. It should be like this. And again, here, your expiration does not reach baseline. So your inspiratory flow starts way before the expiration starts uh, reaching baseline. And then you end up with excess peep here, okay, or auto peep. So uh, how do we prevent atelectasis is by using adequate PEEP. Uh, I'm not going to give you a number because there is no specific number for uh, what we call adequate PEEP. It depends on the lung pathology uh, you are dealing with, depends on the compliance that you have in your lungs. Uh, but again, always try to aim for open lung strategy. You need to have enough PEEP to open up the lungs and have uniform lung expansion in both lungs, top to bottom. Always aim to try to keep the FIO2 below 40%. Most of the time, unless you have pulmonary hypertension or extra pulmonary shunt, uh, if your FIO2 is too high, it's because your lungs most likely are not open enough. Okay? So always try to aim for FIO2 less than 40%. Okay? Again, again, unless you have pulmonary hypertension, uh, then uh, that's a different condition. So uh, how do we know that your PEEP is, is good enough or is adequate? Now we look at the, again, the volume pressure curve. As you can see here, uh, the inspiration in red uh, starts being flat at the beginning. So you need a lot of pressure before you get any air into the lungs. That's because your PEEP is too low here, okay? So what you should do, this is the opening, opening pressure here for these uh, lungs. So what you should do is start your curve right from here. So the way you do that is by increasing the PEEP. So let's PEEP the heat is, let's say, four, five. You increase the PEEP to six, seven, whatever the number is, and you will see that now the compliance start from here. So you don't get a plateau, okay? So this is ideal. This is what you should be looking at, okay? So no delay in the opening of your lungs. So always look at your volume pressure loop to see where your uh, compliance are changing and also the, the angle of that compliance. It should be around 45 degrees. This is too flat here, okay? So you are having a low peep and your compliance is too low. So you should increase the peep and aim for a 45 degrees uh, compliance. So, um, I'm going to give you some general guidelines and, uh, that will also help you uh, to ventilate these babies efficiently and safely. Uh, first, try always to maintain the infant's spontaneous breathing. Paralyzing the baby should always be your last, last resort. Okay? Uh, why? Because the way we ventilate babies is not physiologic. When you put a baby in a ventilator, you're opening the lungs with pressure from the outside. Normally, the way we breathe is by causing negative pressure in your lungs. So you cause negative pressure, and the air is aspirated into the lungs. That's physiologic. When you push the air from outside with the ventilator, that's non-physiologic. So maintaining, maintaining the baby's spontaneous breathing will help you to minimize that pressure, because the breath will be initiated by a negative pressure that will allow you to decrease the amount of pressure that you need 
to get the air into the lungs. So always, always try to maintain babies spontaneous breathing. Don't use too much sedation. Don't, don't put the baby apneic. That's not good. Minimize sedation. Try to minimize respiratory depression. Use caffeine. That will also help you, especially in preterm infants, to maintain spontaneous uh, breathing. Avoid hypercapnia. If you're hyperventilating, your CO2 will be too low, and that will inhibit breathing in any baby. So always aim for a normal CO2 or slightly high CO2, okay? what we call permissive hypercapnia, in which you're going to stimulate baby's own respiratory drive because your CO2 is too high. If CO2 is too low, the baby is not going to breathe. And again, as I said before, always, always works to an early extubation. As soon as the baby is ready, take the tube out. Don't leave the baby intubated just because it's more convenient for the baby or the nurse or whoever is looking after the baby. Okay? So removing the tube as fast as appropriate or not intubating at all, if you can avoid it. Self-evident that never being ventilated is better than being ventilated. We know that uh, although BPD uh, can occur in babies that had never been ventilated, definitely severe cases of BPD are not seen in babies that were never ventilated. Okay? You can get BPD, but usually those cases are very mild. If the baby needs surfactant, try to use surfactant as soon as possible. Don't delay surfactant treatment if you think the baby needs it. And if your unit can use mist, minimally invasive surfactant treatment, that's even better because you're trying to avoid putting a tube in the baby's uh, throat and exposing those lungs to positive pressure ventilation that usually it's, it goes along when you put a tube in, okay? So if you use mist, most of the time you're gonna avoid using any pressure ventilation and uh, putting a big tube through the vocal cords. And again, the challenge is sometimes is to know exactly which babies will need uh, surfactant uh, as soon as possible. And that's as a clinical adjustment that you need to use. So I'm gonna give you just a, a small uh, lung injury prevention bundle that I put together. This is for preterm infants, okay? They're very general uh, guidelines. First, always use prenatal steroids. If the babies are less than three, four weeks, as you know. Uh, use interpartum, interpartum antibiotics for premature, prolonged, uh, premature rupture of memory, especially for babies under 32 weeks. At birth, always, always use prophylactic CPAP. The first thing you need to do is put the baby on CPAP. Always be ready. Somebody should have the prongs ready, the machine ready. As soon as the baby is put on the bed, just apply the CPAP, okay? That's the best way to help the baby to um, open up the lungs after birth. Avoid bagging with high pressure, okay? Uh, if you can, avoid bagging at all. Uh, sometimes you have to be patient with these babies, especially if you're dealing with a small babies. Uh, try to give time. Just use CPAP alone. Most babies, after four or five minutes of adequate CPAP, will be able to generate enough lung volume, will be able to maintain that uh, breathing. Okay? So avoid high pressures uh, and be patient. Uh, always, always blend the oxygen. Only use the amount of oxygen you think the baby needs. Don't use 100% oxygen. Okay, I'm not gonna give you a number because it depends on the type of lung condition you're dealing with, okay? And some babies will need 25%, some babies will need 30, some babies will need 40. So always adjust the FR2 according to the SATs, ideally pre-ductal SATs, right arm um, uh, on the baby. Always, as I said before, preserve spontaneous breathing. In the first 24 hours, early rescue surfactant, ideally using mist. Early caffeine uh, doesn't have to be urgent, but as soon as you get an IV, you give a loading dose of caffeine to stimulate spontaneous breathing. Uh, again, careful attention to optimal PEEP. Always, always adjust your PEEP according to X-ray, blood gases, and so on, as, and pulmonary graphics, as I mentioned before. If you really need to intubate, always try to use what we call ACVG, okay? ACVG uh, is a mode of ventilation in which you target your volume and the baby will be assisted on every single breath the baby takes. We think that AC is a much better and physiologic mode than SIMB. Because SIMB, you only are gonna support 
a percentage of the total breathing of the baby. With AC, you are assisting every single breath. Okay? So every single breath will be exactly the same. Okay? We think it's much more physiologic and, 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 and better than SIB. As I said before, try to avoid hypercarbia. Use permissive hypercarbia. Don't aim for a high CO2, but use aim for a CO2 that is compatible with the lung pathology in your delivery. If you're dealing with a lousy lungs, you can't have a CO2 in the 40s. Okay? So you have to aim for a CO2 that is compatible with the type of lung disease you're dealing with. If your lung disease is very bad, you may need to deal with a CO2 in the 50s or even low 60s. Okay? So if you have normal lungs, yeah, aim for a CO2 of 40. So always aim your CO2 based on the lung pathology you're dealing with. And as I said before, try to always use early extubation either to CPAP alone if the condition is not severe enough or as we're going to discuss in the next talk, try to use NIPPV or any other form of non-invasive uh, ventilation. And uh, in our center, we always use uh, conventional ventilation first. We don't use prophylactic high frequency, uh, but we use early rescue high frequency. In our center, we use mostly the jet ventilator. I know here is uh, the oscillator is more common, and uh, you're more familiar with the oscillator and the jet. But regardless of the high frequency mode you use, always try to use early rescue. So when you are ventilating the baby conventionally and your pressures are breathing too high or you need very high volumes to control the CO2, that may be a time where you need to think about uh, switching to high frequency. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, three cases. Uh, case number one, here we have a baby that was born to a 30-year-old mom. Uh, she was GBS positive, uh, and eventful pregnancy, and uh, she ruptured membrane for uh, four hours, clear fluid, and the baby was born by a spontaneous vaginal vertex delivery. So at one hour of age, um, so this infant is a female, uh, 37 weeks, uh, gestational age, uh, birth weight 2,800 grams, APGARS 3 and 7, and the baby is presenting with moderate uh, respiratory distress. And SATs are 89% on 50% oxygen by uh, face mask. So this baby now, uh, uh, we do a blood gas at one hour of age, uh, the baby is on CPAP of six, and the blood gas shows a pH of seven to seven, PCO2 of uh, 55 and a PO2 of 60 on 50% oxygen. So uh, here's the x-ray, bad x-ray. So most likely this baby has either meconium aspiration, although the fluid was clear, or this baby has a pneumonia. Okay, as you can see, these lungs are bad, has a lot of uh, infiltrates, atelectasis, uh, is not very homogeneous. The right and the left lungs are not affected equally. The top of the lung is less affected than the bottom, okay? And now when you do a gas, you repeat a gas at two hours of age, the baby now is, is worse. It has a pH of 7.19. PCO2 has jumped up to 69, and now you're on 60% oxygen, and a PO2 is 60. So here we have two problems. Your CO2 is too high, and your FiO2 is too high. Okay? And the baby is still on CPAP. So what do you do? You need to intubate, right? Right, okay. Because you're dealing with problem with ventilation and oxygenation. So here you have a problem in what you have significant hypercarbia and hypoxemia. And this is most likely because of telectasis and consolidation, okay? Now, clinically, this baby will show uh, moderate to severe respiratory stress because atelectasis will decrease your compliance, so they will need harder increased work of breathing to open up the lungs. That's why the distress is more severe. Uh, you're going to have, as I showed you before, significant atelectasis and low lung volume on x-ray. Yeah, these lungs are not open. Third, you're going to have significant CO2 retention and increased oxygen requirement. So here we have a condition in which you have problem with both CO2 and oxygenation because of non-homogeneous lung disease. Okay? So what's the main pathophysiology here? Well, you have VQ mismatch. You have a disease, you have areas of the lungs that are not open. So those areas 
are shunting. You have right to left shunt inside the lungs because of atelectasis, okay? So uh, that's why your oxygenation is a problem. And you also have decreased lung compliance. So for the, non the normal physiologic volume, you're not gonna be able to achieve enough minute ventilation to bring your CO2 down, okay? So those are the main two reasons why this baby is retaining CO2 and requiring high oxygen. So what do you do? How do you ventilate this condition? Well, again, I'm gonna give you some guidelines. I'm gonna give you, sh I'm gonna give you some numbers. But again, these are just numbers that you start with. And then you need to adjust those numbers according to the response of what you see uh, in the baby. Based on blood gases, x-ray, you can use uh, uh, lung ultrasound, if you have lung ultrasound, and so on. And looking at the pulmonary graphics. But I'll give you some guidelines. If you're on CPAP, and you are dealing with significant hypercapnia and hypoxemia, you need to open up the lungs. So you need to go up on your PEEP, okay? So you need to use moderate to high PEEP, seven, eight, nine, if, uh, but I wouldn't push it more than eight or nine. Consider intubation if the AFI2 is more than 60% and or the pH is less than 7.25. Okay, don't keep the babies on CPAP too long, especially if you're dealing with the high AFI2s and high CO2s, okay? If you already intubated and you're on conventional mechanical ventilation, okay, uh, try to use moderate longer inspiratory time. Again, you're dealing with a condition that the time constant is a bit too long, okay? Because you're dealing with uh, high, most likely high airway resistance, if this is pneumonia or uh, meconia aspiration. So your inspiratory time will have to be a bit longer to be able to achieve that full expansion of the alveoli, okay? Uh, but again, look at your flow waveform to know if the inspiratory time you're using is the right length. You may need to use also relatively high tidal volumes, okay? Uh, again, because you have a lot of atelectasis and your compliance is low, you may need to open up the lungs using slightly higher tidal volume. So 4.5 to 5.5 is a start point, and then you need to adjust accordingly. Again, try to use AC VG mode, okay? Uh, volume guarantee using AC. Now, if you're already on high frequency oscillator uh, and you're dealing with significant hypercapnia and hypoxemia, Again, you need to open up the lungs. You need to use enough mean air pressure to open up the lungs. So you need to look at your chest x-ray, you need to look at your blood gases, and, and see if you're really opening up the lungs properly, okay? And the only way you do that on the oscillator is by cranking up your mean air pressure, okay? And look at the response, especially the FiO2. If you're achieving good lung volume, the FiO2 should start coming down, okay? Always, when you're dealing with non-homogeneous lung disease, you always are at risk of causing air trapping, okay? Because your time constant is too long. So you cannot go very fast. You have to slow down, okay? So you're using high frequency, use low frequencies. In the oscillator, usually it's five to six hertz, okay? Don't go too fast because you're gonna get in trouble with air trapping, especially in the oscillator, okay? The amplitude should be enough to maintain an acceptable CO2. Ideally, you don't wanna use an amplitude that is more than three times the mineral pressure, because again, you're gonna increase the risk of air traffic significantly if you are more than three times the mineral pressure, okay? So if your CO2 is too high after that, you may need to increase your mineral pressure to allow uh, uh, using a higher amplitude, or as we do in our center, use a different mode of ventilation and go to the jet, if you have the jet, okay? So if you're on the jet, uh, again, same as the oscillator, use enough mineral pressure to open up the lungs. And the way you manipulate mineral pressure on the jet is by increasing the PEEP on the conventional ventilator attached to the jet, okay? So use enough PEEP to open up the lungs on the jet. Frequencies, again, should be low, no more than 240, 280 for the same reason as we said on the oscillator. There is a risk for air trapping, so you need to slow down. You need to have enough time for expiration to allow the lungs to be completely empty after each breath. Otherwise, you end up with air trapping. 
So, uh, second case. Here we have a case in which uh, it's a bit different. Um, 30 year old mom, G2P1, GBS negative, and even full pregnancy, rupture memory for four hours, uh, meconium stain, amniotic fluid, and spontaneous vaginal vertex delivery. So, at a one hour of age, uh, so this baby is a male, uh, 41 weeks, uh, birth weight, oh, not 31 grams, 3,100 grams, APGAR 5 and 8. And this baby also has mild to moderate respiratory distress. Okay? And the baby is breathing quite, quite fast, 90 to 100 breaths uh, per minute. And the SATs are 92% on 27% oxygen on CPAP 07. So oxygenation is not a big problem here. Okay? This baby is only on 27% oxygen. And the SATs are 92. But this baby is having significant respiratory stress and is breathing quite, quite fast. Okay? So you need to be careful. This is the x-ray. So this is a different x-ray that we saw before. As you can see, there is not a lot of atelectasis here. But what you can see here is you have very open lungs. The diaphragms are low, and the heart is quite small. Okay? So most likely here you're dealing with air trapping from increased airway resistance from meconium. Okay? So the main problem here is not atelectasis. It's over distension. Okay? So when you do a gas, you find that an out of age, the reason is of eight, and the pH is 7.15 with a CO2 of 72. Your PO2 is not bad, 60 on 25% oxygen. So the main issue here is not oxygenation, it's CO2 retention. Okay? So here you have dealing with mostly hypercapnia, and this could be due usually to either air trapping from increased airway resistance from meconium or significant secretion. Okay? So clinically, these babies are going to have mild to moderate respiratory stress. Usually, they're going to be very tachypnic, mostly tachypnic. Okay? The other baby that we saw before will have significant increased work of breathing. This baby will have minimal increased work of breathing, but they will be very tachypnic. Okay? Uh, usually, what you see is high level of CO2 in this proportion with the oxygen requirements. So this, the amount of CO2 you're retaining doesn't match the FiO2, okay? not as before. And as you said, you saw in the x-ray, you have signs of hyperinflation on x-ray. Okay? And clinically, you can see a barrel chest with increased anterior posterior uh, diameter. So the pathophysiology, the main pathophysiology in this case is you have a ball valve, this obstruction, with high airway resistance to airflow, mostly on expiration. Okay? And you have increased dead space, and that allows then your minute ventilation, your alveolar ventilation will be decreased. And that's why you are retaining uh, CO2. Okay? So you have decreased alveolar ventilation because your dead space is too high. So how do you ventilate this baby? If so if you're on CPAP, uh, try to consider decreasing the PEEP. Maybe your PEEP is too high here, and that's the reason you have air trap. Uh, if your pH is less than 7.25, consider intubation. Okay? If you're on conventional mechanical ventilation and you are already on ACVG, try to decrease the backup frequency. Maybe your backup frequency is too high, so maybe you need to bring it down. Uh, you may need to increase sedation. If the baby is breathing 100 per minute, uh, the baby is actually, you, you won't be able to control that with ACVG. Okay? So you need to bring your CO2 down. And the only way you do that is by sometimes you need to sedate the baby. You need to slow down the baby's spontaneous breathing to allow more time for expiration and correct the uh, air trapping. Consider also decreasing the PEEP if your PEEP is, is too high. And also consider decreasing the inspiratory time. Maybe your inspiratory time is too high and that's why you are shortening. Your TE is too short. Okay? If you are on SIMB VG, uh, you can actually decrease your frequency. If you have a frequency of 40, 50, 60, try to use your backup frequency down to 20, 30 and see if you can correct the, um, the uh, CO2 retention and the air trap. But again, if the baby is breathing way above that, you need to slow the baby's spontaneous breathing to allow it to control the CO2. And again, it may need a higher VT because you have an increased dead space. So most of your VT is going to dead space. So in that case, you may need to increase your volume, uh, tidal volume, to be able to increase alveolar ventilation. If you're on high frequency oscillation, uh, consider decreasing the mineral pressure. Your mineral pressure may be too high, so you need to bring it down a little bit. 
uh, decrease the frequency, your frequency is too high, again, slow down. You need to slow down because you need more time for expiration. Uh, again, always use enough amplitude to maintain the CO2, but always try to aim for an amplitude that is less than three times the mineral pressure because the risk of trapping goes up significantly. And if you cannot control the CO2, that way consider a different mode of ventilation. In that case, I will use uh, the jet that has a significant and less risk for air trapping. If you're on the jet, okay, consider decreasing the PEEP or the mineral pressure. Uh, decrease the frequency if you are too high. Again, slow down, bring it down to about 240, which is the minimal frequency that we use on the jet. Uh, if you are using backup breath, remove that, because that will also increase the risk of a trapping. So you have to remove your side breath. And also use enough PIP to control the CO2, which is the only parameter that you use on the jet to control CO2, which is PIP. Okay? Okay, third case, this is the last case. Now we are dealing with a preterm infant, okay? So this is a 25-year-old mom, G1P0, 29 weeks, GBS negative, uneventful pregnancy, uh, rupture memory for four hours, clear fluid, vaginal delivery. So this baby at an hour of age, so it's a male, uh, 1,250 grams, upgrade seven and eight. This baby also has moderate respiratory stress, and SATs are 89% on 40% oxygen by face mask, okay? So uh, when you look at the x-ray, this baby has a classical x-ray of highland membrane disease in which you have bilateral reticular ground and pattern. This is a very homogeneous lung disease. You see almost uh, the lungs are equally affected left to right, and the top is almost exactly the same as, as the bottom. So this is uh, an homogeneous lung disease, okay? So uh, an hour of age, this baby is on CPAP of six and has a pH of 723. CO2 of 60, and PO2 55 on 50% oxygen. So similar to the first case, this baby is dealing with hypercapnia and hypoxemia. But in this case, it's mostly due to bilateral diffuse atelectasis from surfactant deficiency. So it's a classical case of homogeneous lung disease. The first case was non-homogeneous. The main difference between the two, the non-homogeneous will have a significant longer times constant. You need a longer inspiratory time, to reach the alveoli at a longer expiratory time to empty the lungs. When you're dealing with homogeneous lung disease, surfactant deficiency, your time constant is very short. So you don't need very long expiratory time, and you don't need long expiratory time. You can ventilate this baby very fast, okay? You're, you're not gonna get in trouble with the trapping, okay? So, these babies usually have moderate to severe respiratory stress, Again, significant diffuse atelectasis with decreased lung volume on x-ray, and they have CO2 retention and increased oxygen requirement. So, if you're on CPAP, what do you do? Well, you need to be able to open up the lungs. So you need to go up on your PEEP, okay? Whatever PEEP you're using, go up, okay? Again, in a preterm infant, 29, 29 weeks, I wouldn't go much higher than eight before you do something else, okay? Uh, consider intubation. And surfactant, if your FiO2 is more than 30% oxygen and or your pH is less than, than 7.25 when you are already on CPAP of 8. Don't try to push the CPAP too much higher than that. You need to be surfactant. And if you're using lung ultrasound, you can also use the lung ultrasound to get a score to see if the baby will actually need surfactant or not. So if you're already on conventional mechanical ventilation, you need to shorten your inspiratory time. You use short inspiratory time. Again, your time constant is very short here. So you don't need to uh, use longer inspiratory time. These babies are usually can be ventilated with a TI of 0.27 or 0.3. Look at your flow waveform, okay? And see the minimum amount of TI you can use to, uh, uh, until your flow goes back to baseline. Second, use low Tidal volume, okay? In these babies, volume trauma is quite uh, risky, so try to use the minimal amount of volume that will give you a normal CO2, okay? So usually four to five mLs per kilo. Always try to use ACVG, okay? That will be the default mode of conventional mechanical ventilation. If you're already on high frequency oscillator, uh, again, use whatever mineral pressure to open up the lungs, okay? Uh, I won't give you a number. You need to look at the chest ray, 
chest x-ray, you need to look at your uh, uh, blood gases to know if you, your lungs are open or not. Again, here, because the viscover trapping is low, you can use high frequencies. You can go fast, okay? And that will also help to minimize lung injury. And always, as I said before, this is standard, the amplitude should always be less than three times the mineral pressure. If you're on the jet, again, uh, use enough mineral pressure to open up the lungs, which is usually the PEEP. The PEEP is the mineral pressure basically on the jet. Use high frequency, again, you don't need to slow down here. You have short inspiratory time, uh, time constant, so you can go fast. You can use frequencies of uh, 320, 360, okay? The faster you go on the high frequency, the more you dampen your pressure into alveoli, okay? So your alveoli will see less pressure the faster you go. In this case, that's what you want. And always use PIP to control CO2. Doesn't matter the number. You need to use enough PIP to control your, your CO2. Remember, that PIP, don't be scared by seeing high numbers, 35, 40, because again, most of those pressures will be significantly attenuated. That's not the pressure that the alveoli is seeing, it's the pressure that the airway is seeing proximally. But the alveoli is seeing pressures that are way, way lower than that. And that's it. So um, welcome to questions and uh, comments. Yeah. I know I gave you a lot of information today, so. Thank you so much, Professor Alvero, for an excellent, excellent lecture. Uh, we will excuse the audience to postpone the questions uh, until the end of this session. Okay. Can you please go ahead with the uh, uh, next lecture. Um, and the title will be Gentle Non-Invasive Ventilation in the Preterm Infant, which is the target in the, per in the bundle that you talked to us about. Thank you. So you're stuck with me again. Okay, so um, in the first session we talk about invasive ventilation and how to minimize lung injury. As I said before, even if you are an expert on mechanical ventilation, it's almost impossible to avoid lung injury, especially in the tiny babies, uh, because of the problems that I referred to already. So. Uh, the, way, the best way to really try to avoid lung injury is try to prevent intubation and to prevent exposing these babies to mechanical ventilation, okay? And that's the topic for the next uh, session. So I have no conflicts uh, before. The objective will be to identify the basic principles of non-invasive ventilation, to describe the different type of non-invasive ventilation, to describe the advantages and limitations on non-invasive ventilation uh, in preterm infants. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call gentle ventilation. Uh, most of us that are older uh, grew up in an area of neonatology in which we use a different type of approach to the care of the preterm infant in the living room. Uh, I will summarize that by saying that the, the type of care that we were using is referred as the uh, reactive care or the firefighter approach. We try to put off the fire all the time. We were always reacting to what the baby was throwing at us, okay? So, and that uh, type of care was characterized by mostly reacting to emergencies, waiting for things to happen. We were destroying things in, uh, in a way to the things that we're dealing with, and we were not patient. Okay, we have no time for patients. This is the way we practice neonatology 20, 25 years ago. Okay, when I was a fellow, a resident, this is the way I was taught. Okay, this is this this was neonatology 25, 30 years ago. Fortunately, things has changed, has changed a lot, 
and if we haven't, we should, okay? Ideally, you want to have what we call the preventive care or the gardener approach, okay? This type of approach is different. First of all, it tries to prevent the problems, not to react to problems. Second, try to anticipate things that could happen. Third, creates a nature environment. And finally, is characterized by being a lot, a lot more patient than the reactive approach, okay? So, the firefighter approach is usually interventional and invasive. The preventive care approach or gardener approach is observational and gentle. And this is the way we should practice neonatology nowadays, okay? So, going from interventional to non-invasive is how do we do that? By limiting the amount of oxygen that we expose these babies to, limiting the amount of inflating pressures that we're exposing these lungs to, early use of non-invasive ventilation, and finally using also minimally invasive surfactant treatment if the baby uh, needs surfactant. Now, one of the ways that we can achieve all that is by using nasal CPAP. And nasal CPAP has shown to significantly decrease lung injury, has significantly shown decreased incidence of BPD, and it's a motor ventilation that everybody should be using first, okay? No baby should be intubated prophylactically, no matter how small, how immature the baby is, prophylactic uh, CPAP should be the first mode of treatment that any baby should receive right from the get-go, okay? Now, how does CPAP work? Well, CPAP works in different, many different ways. First, it helps us to develop an effective FRC. We know that using the right PEEP reduces atelectric trauma, improves oxygenation, decreases airway resistance, splints chest wall, chest wall and airway, improves surfactant metabolism, prevents intrapulmonary shunt if you're using the right amount of PEEP and keep the lungs open, decreases the work of breathing, and finally, also we know that CPAP promotes regular breathing, okay? So CPAP works in many different ways, and it's usually very effective. Now, what's the problem with CPAP? The problem with CPAP is summarized in this slide. This study was done by Dr. Morley in Australia, the group from Australia, that did a randomized controlled trial, uh, trying to prophylactically intubate uh, half the babies under 28 weeks compared to using prophylactic CPAP and only using rescue surfactant in the same group of babies um, before uh, 28 weeks. And as you can see here, even when you try to prevent intubation, 55% of babies in the 25-26 group require intubation. Okay? Even if you try not to intubate, even if you use CPAP, more than half of those babies will eventually need intubation because CPAP is not enough. And even in the 27, 28 weeks, 40% of those babies will need intubation. So this is a real problem that we are facing, okay? Even when you, you wanna use CPAP, some of these babies need more than CPAP, okay? And that's why nowadays there have been other modes of ventilation that have been developed, try to see if we can minimize the need for intubation using other forms of advanced CPAP or non-invasive ventilation, okay? So this is where nasal or non-invasive ventilation uh, comes into play. So what is non-invasive ventilation? We know that CPAP remains the core element of all the strategies of non-invasive ventilation. The baseline is always CPAP. Second, is a mode of respiratory support that increases or try to increase alveolar ventilation without the need of an tracheal tube or a tracheostomy tube. So it's basically a form of nasal CPAP with superimposed non-synchronized or NIPPV or synchronized SNIPPV ventilator delivered breath. Any ventilator in the unit can be used for NIPPV. Now for SNIPPV or synchronized, you need a different mode of ventilation that uh, we're gonna talk about, okay? So the main goal of non-invasive ventilation is always to prevent intubation and mechanical ventilation, okay? That's the main goal. So, how is non-invasive ventilation better than CPAP? And this is where we don't know exactly how non-invasive ventilation works. There have been a lot of studies showing different things. 
Uh, what I will do is try to summarize things that we think are uh, the NIV is doing that CPAP cannot do. First, with NIV, you can increase mirror ventilation and tidal volume, which you cannot do with uh, CPAP. Uh, you also, especially if you use synchronized NIV, you can reduce thorough abdominal asynchrony. You may decrease the work of breathing better than CPAP. You may improve oxygenation better than CPAP. You also may decrease the number of incidence and severity of central apneas through stimulation of the airway better than CPAP. And finally, you can also decrease obstructive apneas through splinting of the airways better than you can do with nasal CPAP. Okay? So I'm going to summarize all the different modes of NIB that we have available nowadays. I'm going to start with the, the basic CPAP. As you know, there are three basic models of CPAP. One is bubble CPAP, which is the simplest and the cheapest way to deliver uh, NASA CPAP. Uh, the other one is the continuous flow CPAP, which is the one that we get with our ventilators uh, in the unit, or is ventilator CPAP. And the third one is what we call the variable flow uh, CPAP, that uses it the uh, fluidic change, in which uh, you have special prongs that will facilitate uh, inspiration by uh, increasing flow during inspiration, and during expiration there will be a flip, so the baby will expire into the expiratory limbs, and the flow coming from the ventilator will be flipped to expiratory flow, and that's the way it decreases uh, work of breathing for the baby during expiration, and also will help to maintain a much more uh, stable uh, CPAP pressure. Okay. So here we have the conventional ventilator on the top. Usually you get a lot of variation on the CPAP pressure. Using the variable flow CPAP, the CPAP pressure is much more stable. Okay. Now, having said that, most of the studies that compare the three different modes of CPAP have not shown a significant long-term differences. So whatever CPAP you use, most likely is fine. Just get familiar with the CPAP mode you have, either bubble CPAP, continuous flow, or variable flow, okay? Uh, don't think that one you have to change because one is superior than the other because no, no form of CPAP has been shown consistently to be superior than the other, okay? All of them are effective, okay? NIPPV, so these are intermittent positive pressure ventilation that we add to the CPAP, okay? And there are two forms. One is synchronized, or NIPPV, or one is non-synchronized, or NIPPV. Now, the synchronize usually there are two ways of trying to synchronize those positive pressure ventilations on top of CPAP. <clears throat> U1 is using a capsule, abdominal capsule, that will pick up the baby's own spontaneous breathing and will try to deliver the breath when the capsule is stimulated. Unfortunately, this is not available anymore, at least in North America. Okay? Uh, why? Because the capsule was never sensitive enough to provide a proper synchronization with uh, the CPAP. So this is not available anymore. The other form is a newer form, is by flow. So you basically have a flow transducer at the nose, and the flow transducer will pick up negative pressure uh, triggered by the baby's spontaneous breathing, and that will uh, hopefully deliver that breath. These are newer machines. Uh, there are not many studies to see if the synchronization obtained by flow is better. Than, than by capsule, uh, or if it's sensitive enough. Uh, we have a new machine in our unit that is synchronized by flow. Uh, we're gonna test that. Uh, again, hopefully it will work, because really synchronization should be better than non-synchronization. So, what would be the advantage of uh, non-invasive ventilation? Uh, what are the studies have shown? Well, we know that by the review done by uh, Cochrane in 2016, we know that NIPPV, this is non-synchronized IPPV, reduces the rate of respiratory failure and intubation among preterm infants with RDS when compared to nasal CPAP, okay? So there's evidence to show that NIPPV is better than CPAP when you were trying to prevent intubation uh, for the first time. Another review done uh, in 2017 also show that NIPPV reduces the need for re-intubation when compared to nasal CPAP. So when you extubate a baby and you put these babies on NIPPV, the rate of re-intubation is significantly decreased 
on NIPPV compared to CPAP. But there is a study that was published in the New England Journal, 2013, that did not look at short-term outcomes. The only objective was to look at long-term outcomes, okay? BPD, neurological outcome, at two years of age. And that study done by Kirpalani, we were part of that study, is that NIPB does not improve the outcome of death or BPD when compared to NISA-CIPA. Now, you need to be aware, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this study. Uh, this study used many different type of NIPPB and the most common form of NIPPB was uh, variable flow, a CPAP or infant flow, which is not a true form of NIPPB because they only use two levels of CPAP. So 9, 6, 10, 7, 11, 7, which we don't think it was enough to actually improve avial ventilation. So I will caution to look at this result. Uh, we, we need, I think we need a better long-term study using real NIPPV or better synchronized NIPPV looking at long-term mouse scan and BPD to see if actually we are making a long-term difference or not, okay? So synchronization versus non-synchronization. Well, ideally, you really want to deliver those breaths when the vocal cords are open, okay? And you can only achieve that with synchronization. When you're using NIPPV that is non-synchronized, most of the time you're gonna deliver that breath when the vocal cords are closed, okay? And you're gonna cause more chest wall distortion. And that may also cause problems. So ideally, you wanna really synchronize those uh, positive pressure breath with the baby's own spontaneous breath. That should be the goal, okay? So definitely that should be physiologically more advantageous. If we do that, we can improve ventilation, gas exchange, and decrease the breathing effort. We can provide the infant the ability to vary his own respiratory rate uh, according to his own demands uh, without interfering with the ventilator. And we want, if we do that, if we synchronize properly, we also decrease uh, the airway resistance by maintaining coordination between the airway dilator muscles and, and the diaphragm. Now, the problem is that they have, we have no trials so far that have properly compared synchronized with non-synchronized NIPV on important outcomes. Second, we have no trials that have examined the accuracy of synchronization devices in NIV, especially using the, the new uh, flow system, okay? And finally, we have no trials have properly evaluated the advantages of synchronization with nasal ventilation. So ideally, physiologically, it makes sense but we need studies, we need trials to show that really we are making a difference with synchronization. For the time being, most centers are using non-synchronized NIPPV. Okay, so uh, what type of nasal uh, uh, interfaces can we use for NIV? Ideally, short by nasal prongs have shown to be better than nasopharyngeal single tube, okay? Because the resistance is significantly less when you use short by nasal prongs compared to nasopharyngeal uh, uh, tube. So we don't recommend using nasopharyngeal uh, endotracheal tubes, okay? So always use binasal prongs. Now, there are different types of binasal prongs. One is the Hudson cannula, which is very bulky and stiff, and is great because the, uh, the resistance is quite low, but it's quite difficult to maintain those heavy prongs in the baby's nose. It requires a lot of nursing time, okay? So we use these prongs many years ago. We don't use it anymore, not because they don't work, because it's a lot of work and causes a lot of uh, nasal damage. Second, we can use the Argyle cannula. We were the old uh, uh, prongs that I don't think many will use them anymore because they are showing very high uh, uh, resistance. Uh, I think one of the best one is the flow generator, which is the one that I explained before, uh, when you have the infant flow or the arabella. These are prongs that will use the fluidic change that will promote uh, decreased work of breathing by flipping the flow during inspiration and expiration as spontaneously uh, by um, uh, physics, okay? So there are two types, infant flow and arabella, two different companies that use the same type of uh, uh, principle. And then you have a new uh, form, which is nasal mask. Uh, it was developed mostly by Dreger. That are quite effective, quite nice. Uh, they are very soft, they're very small. You need to use the right size to be able to cover the whole nose. 
without putting pressure anywhere else. And um, they seem to be quite effective and trying to maintain, maintain the pressure much more stable than the prongs, okay? So another form of uh, non-invasive ventilation is what we call the heated, humidified, high-flow nasal cannula. Now, this form of non-invasive ventilation uh, has become very, very popular. I don't know here, but especially in the States. In North America, a lot of units have moved away from CPAP to use these high-flow cannulas. The reason for that is because it's way, way easier than regular prongs for CPAP. You have better access to the base face. The nurses like it a lot because it's way more easier to maintain the, those prongs in place. Uh, you get better interaction with the parents. The parents love it. So there are a lot of units that try to switch right away to high flow nasal cannula. So what's the evidence that this high flow nasal cannula is effective and safe? Well, first of all, uh, how does it work? We don't really know. Uh, we know that it provides extending pressure by flow. We know that may cause dead space washout, and that's the way that uh, decreases CO2. Uh, we know that it decreases inspiratory resistance. And the indication for high flow nasal cannula could be as either as a primary mode for treating RDS, uh, it has been used to treat amyo prematurity, has been used to try to prevent extubation failure, and also a form of uh, winning CPAP. What's the main problem with high flow nasal cannula is you have no idea how much pressure you're using. Because the pressure does not only depends on the flow, depends on the flow you're using, depends on the amount of leak you have between the prongs and the nose, so that depends on the size of the nose, and, and dep depends also on the size of the prongs they're using. So you have no idea how much pressure you're using. You could be using pressure that are too low for the type of Lyme disease you, uh, you're dealing with, or pressure that may be too high. Okay? So you have no way to measure that, and that's a problem. Most of the studies have shown that uh, compared to nasal CPAP, when you use high flow nasal cannula, your risk for developed BPD goes up, and the rate for reintubation is higher with high flow nasal cannula. So I would not recommend using high flow nasal cannula as a primary mode to deliver CPAP. We use it, we have it in the unit, in our unit, uh, the only time I use it is when a baby, you know a baby needs very low CPAP, those chronic babies that uh, uh, you are getting nasal damage, uh, babies that don't really need high pressures and are quite chronic, then you can try to switch to a uh, high flow nasal cannula. But I will not use high flow as a primary mode of trying to prevent intubation or after extubation. Okay? So, recommendations I would say, only heat it, humidify high flow with flows more than two liters. Prongs should not completely occlude the nerves. Consider always the infant's weights to set flow rates. So the higher the weight, the higher the flow you should use. And again, because of uncertainty about efficacy, safety, and lack of long-term outcome, its widespread use cannot be recommended in preterm infants. So what else we have? Well, we have a relatively new form of non-invasive ventilation we call nasal high-frequency ventilation. So we know that high-frequency ventilation works when you are intubated. So people thought, well, what about if you use high-frequency nasally? Can we actually provide good alveolar ventilation by using high-frequency through the nose without intubation? So uh, what we know, but most of the studies have done comparing high-frequency uh, nasal ventilation with CPAP is that high-frequency nasal ventilation may have similar effect that NIPPB in reducing the need for reintubation when compared to nasal CPAP, may decrease PCO2 levels by improving alveolar ventilation when compared with nasal CPAP, may decrease the rate of significant apneas when compared with nasal CPAP, but most studies have shown no differences with nasal CPAP in improving oxygenation even when higher mirror, mirror pressure are used. So if your main issue is apneas or high CO2s, nasal high frequency ventilation may help. If your problem is high oxygen requirements, most likely high frequency is not gonna help you. 
We need to, you can do the same with CPAP, increasing the pressure, okay? Because actually when you use NASA high frequency, you may have to use higher mineral pressure than your CPAP to achieve the same type of lung volume, okay? So I will not recommend using high frequency just because you have problem with oxygenation. So what else do we have? With a new fancy way of uh, ventilating these babies, uh, nasally is called Neuro Adjusted Ventilatory Assist, or NAVA. Uh, this system was developed in Toronto. Basically, it works in a very fancy way. Uh, you have uh, electrical, uh, an electrode that will detect the electrical activity of the diaphragm. So it's basically a nasal uh, tube that will have a sensor that will sit behind the heart just on top of the diaphragm, okay? And that sensor will pick up activities of the diaphragm, so it will synchronize the delivery of the positive pressure breath when the diaphragm is activated by the baby's spontaneous breathing, but also will measure how much activity it gets from the diaphragm. So it will assist with synchronization on the timing of the breath, but also how much assist the baby will need according to how much power the diaphragm generates. So it's a very fancy. Uh, there's still a lot of research uh, being done with this form of, of treatment. Uh, so basically the way it works is that the baby will start breathing, okay? Uh, the impulse will go through the phrenic nerve, will stimulate the diaphragm, and this fancy electrode will detect that excitation and will send information to the ventilatory unit saying you need to start your breath now. But also, after the excitation, the diaphragm will contract, will cause a significant chest wall and lung expansion, and it will change airway pressure, flow, and volume. And that will also be a triggering mode for this machine to know how much pressure, how much assist needs to deliver to that breath, okay? So in theory, the synchronization is fully in inspiration and expiration, and also assist with the amount of support they need according to how much pressure the baby is generated on his own, okay? But again, we don't have enough information, still a lot of investigation being done with NAVA, uh, it's expensive, and um, so I wouldn't recommend this as a primary mode and for you go and buy a NAVA machine, okay? So, uh, what are the main issues with NIV? Lack of long-term follow-up, Lack of commercially available synchronized ventilators. Success of NIV often depends more on the skills of the user than on the device or the patient interface. So whatever machine you're using, whatever device you're using, don't change your thinking that it will be a better one uh, in somewhere else. Try to get very familiar with the machine you're using because that most likely will improve your success rate, okay? Getting very familiar with the machine. NIV requires more careful, non-invasive monitoring than does the ventilated infant. Many units, uh, nursing staff will say, well, we'll have a one-to-one -one nursing ratio when they is intubated. As soon as you take the tube out, oh, we'll give one to two. So one nurse will have two babies. And I would say the opposite. I would say that, especially for a small baby, it takes more nursing time to keep a baby properly uh, ventilated, non-invasively, and require more nursing time than when there is intubated, okay? Uh, because you need to pay very careful attention that the prongs or the mask is well suited in the nose and you're having a good seal all the time, okay? And that requires more time than when the baby has a tube inside, okay? So if you're a management or you have relationship with management, try to convince them not to decrease nursing ratio when you take the tube out, especially in the first few weeks, or few, uh, weeks after intubation. So here I have a summary of uh, the benefits and risk of all the different mode of non-invasive ventilation that was available. Uh, NACEPAP improves VQ mismatch and oxygenation, maintains FRC, decreases atelectasis, and decreases vocal breathing. Uh, the risk of nasal CPAP is nasal trauma, air leaks, uh, gastric distension. For uh, high, freak, high flow nasal cannula, uh, you have um, uh, usually it's very acceptable by nursing and parents. Uh, easy nursing care, similar to CPAP in a way that delivers uh, positive pressure, uh, a PEEP, a decreased gastric distension compared to CPAP. But again, the main issue is uncontrolled distending pressure. You have no idea how much pressure you're using. 
and this tension pressure can be too high or uh, too low uh, when you're using this form of ventilation. For NIPPV, we know that improved gas exchange and oxygenation, maintains FRC, decreased work of breathing, and decreased need for invasive ventilation, that's been shown. The problem is it causes nasal trauma, similar to CPAP, causes air leaks, may cause gastric extensions. So you need to be sure that you vent the stomach well, especially when you are in a PPV. Uh, if you use high frequency uh, nasal, again, uh, we know that decreases apneas and this adds improve ventilation. The problem is that we have very limited data on how this nasal high frequency works or if it's effective, especially uh, long term, okay? Uh, in terms of NAVA, we know that improves patient ventilator synchrony, inspiration, expiration, and assist control, improves patient comfort, and decrease PIPs because you only provide the PIP that the baby cannot generate on his own. The problem is we have limited data regarding uh, efficacy, and it's a new machine, it's expensive, and uh, the problem is that in extremely low birth weight infant, NAVA may not work as well as bigger babies, okay? Now, this is a graph that Dr. Yasser El Sayed put together in our unit uh, as a guideline on how, when to use and how to use an IPPV. Uh, we have modified this a little bit, but uh, basically this is the way uh, we're gonna try to implement this in our unit. So when you have uh, mild uh, lung disease or an intact respiratory drive, this baby should be extubated to a uh, nasal CPAP that usually requires about one centimeter of water more than the CPAP that you were using when you were intubated. And that's because of the pressure that you lose when you take the tube out. If you're dealing with more severe uh, respiratory stress or you think the baby is too small and it's gonna have a problem with apneas or an unstable respiratory drive, or have failed previous, previous extubation to nasal CPAP, then this is maybe a case in where you can use a non-invasive ventilation. So uh, either you use NIPPV, if you have synchronization, you can use synchronization. If not, just use NIPPV. The PEEP uh, should be the same as in CPAP, always one higher than the PEEP that you were using when you were intubated. Uh, the delta P usually should be around 10, 7 to 10. Uh, the inspiratory time should be a bit longer, usually 0.5 seconds, and the rate between 15 and 20 breaths per minute. If you are more familiar with uh, nasal high frequency ventilation, and this is something that a problem we have in our unit, we have two units in Winnipeg. Uh, one is a women's hospital, the other one is at St. Boniface Hospital. And St. Boniface Hospital has been used high frequency nasal for a long time. So we are much more comfortable, nurses, RTs, with high frequency nasal than NIPPV. In the women's hospital, they never use high frequency nasal and they are more comfortable with NIPPV. So we are not gonna impose what to use. So as I said before, each center is more familiar with one versus the other. And the studies so far have not shown that NIPPV is superior or inferior than nasal high frequency. So right now we're gonna leave it up to the unit to use what they feel more comfortable with. If you're gonna use nasal high frequency, we recommend using a mineral pressure that is usually two centimeter water higher than the CPAP that you were using when you were intubated. The amplitude should be 1.5 to two times the mineral pressure that you're using. And the frequency, usually, you don't need to use more than eight hertz, okay? Now, if you, your CPAP, when you extubate to CPAP and it's tolerated, you're okay. You just win the CPAP based on your oxygen histogram, your clinical response, your lung ultrasound, whatever you use to win a baby off CPAP. If, however, uh, this is not tolerated, and uh, despite maximizing caffeine, despite maximizing uh, CPAP, uh, by, and you see increased fire 2 increased apneas, increased CO2, then you should consider switching to either NIPPV or nasal high frequency ventilation before you reintubate uh, the baby, okay? And again, if this system, either NIPPV or high frequency works, then you slowly win to CPAP, again, guided by oxygen histograms, clinical response, blood gases, and 
languages. Okay. And I think uh, research questions, uh, we don't know if synchronization is essential or not. Uh, we don't know what are the most efficient ventilation settings for NIPPV. Uh, we don't know what are the long-term uh, pulmonary and neurodevelopmental effects of NIV. And uh, maybe NASA high-frequency ventilation, NAVA, be the future of non-invasive ventilation when we get more familiar with those uh, new techniques. And finally, uh, what's the effect of prolonged NIVV support in oxygen saturation targeting and hypoxic events? That's something that we, again, we don't know and needs to be investigated. Take-home messages. Only short-term benefits have been observed for NIV. There are uncertainties and relative benefits of different type of non-invasive ventilation. As used in recent NIPVB international RCT, the Bancalari, the um, Kirpalani study, uh, non-invasive ventilation does not increase survival without VPD in extremely uh, low birth infants. And finally, the success, as I said before, Within IV depends greatly on the skills and commitment of the caring personnel more than the equipment itself. And I think that's it. Thank you very much.